February 1944, I joined the Air Force as a pupil pilot, and I went up to 75 Air School, Littleton. Uh, my course finished its initial period of training, about August, I think it was, and we were looking forward to going to flying school when we were told that the war had entered its final phase, that the Air Force had built up a reserve of pilots, that if we stayed on the pilot's course, the war would end before we got our wings, and finally we told they needed air gunners. So most of the pupils on my course, and a lot of the pupils at 75 Air School, all remustered as gunners. And after arrangements had been made for a large contingent to go down to Port Alfred, we went down to 64 Air School. The course ended towards the end of October. Fodger Railway Station, it was a miserable night, it was dull, it was winter, and it was, they were having a bad winter in, in uh, Europe. And we were told half you were going to 31, half to 34, make up your own minds. So we went over to a transport drive and we said, what can you tell us? What did we know about the squadrons? We'd come straight from flying school. He said, 34's had a bit of trouble, but they're coming right. So we put our kit bags and other stuff onto his transport. We got on and we drove out about 15 kilometers to the 34 squadron camp. Now we left the Union on the 23rd of November and the evening of the 16th December, we were on an operational squadron. So, uh, and we didn't really know what we were doing. We'd, we'd been flying Ansons. I had 19 hours on Ansons with 0.303s. And uh, when we got to the squadron, they, we drew our kit, flying kits and uh, stretchers. We put up a tent. Six of us wanted to stay together, so we drew a tent. Of course, we originally, when we, the day after we got there, we were told, go and look amongst the tents, their vacancies. Unfortunately, their vacancies caused by, uh, you know, for obvious reasons. But we wanted to stay together, so we drew a tent and we put it up at a convenient spot. We were taken down to the Liberators. The, the airstrip was about two kilometers down the road. We were taken down there and shown the beam positions which we were going to use. And we were also shown the mid upper and the, the rear turrets. And then I was, then I joined Captain Andres's crew. Now they'd all come from operational training units and heavy conversion units, so they knew all about the Liberators. So I felt a bit I didn't know much about what I was going to do because they were fully experienced and I'd, I was, had been flying in Ansons. Anyway, we went as we, we learned as we went along and we, we, drew, we were given our flying kit and even that became, in the beginning, was quite a, a tedious business getting dressed. Afterwards, I learned that we would be flying at about 9,000 feet. We did most of our ops at night. <coughs> We flew about 9,000 feet, so we were flying in sub-zero temperatures, so we needed some warm clothing. So before the op, before we went, got ready, that I would uh, get dressed, and that involved putting on a long sleeve vest, long johns. And I was wearing long woolen socks, then I'd put on my shirt, battle dress, winter battle dress trousers and the winter battle dress jacket. And that wasn't warm enough for flying because over that I would put on a heater waistcoat. Now that had long sleeves with press studs at the wrists and there was a lead in the front which I would connect to the aircraft in due course when I learned how to do it. And also had two leads down the back of my legs, one for each leg down to my ankles. Then I would put on heater slippers, connect them to the leads from the, at the back of my legs, they had press studs, connect those there, and then I would put on heater gloves and connect those to the press studs at my wrists. After that, I put on an inner, padded inner flying suit, and that had an um, aperture in the front for the lead from the heater waistcoat, and over that, I would put an outer, a thin outer flying suit, and I believe that was just to protect the inner flying suit. 
flying boots, which were padded, that was nice and warm, and I would then put on leather gauntlets. Over that, of course, I had to put a parachute harness, harness, harness and later on down at the aircraft we'd put on the headset. So I had three of these which got in the way when I tried to work in my beam position and put the gun down. The gun was strapped on the side of the aircraft. I had to open the hatch and bring the gun down onto its fitting. And uh, in the beginning it was rather, I was rather clumsy because all the clothing and the leads got in the way. Anyway, I managed. And the very first flight, I had to disconnect my heat suit, my intercom and the oxygen because Paddy in the rear tudder had knocked his intercom switch over. So Skipper told me to go back and I had to go back to the rear tudder to tell him to put his switch over. And then I had to come back in the darkness and connect my three leads, which I found a bit difficult. I was really green. Anyway, it, we managed all right. In the beginning it was rather difficult, and, but I, I, I admired the, the, the bright lights over the target and I didn't worry about the flak in the beginning because the sky was a beautiful, it was like Guy Fawkes. And uh, it was really something to see, but later on I didn't appreciate the lights and I, I worried more about the flak. Anyway, so I managed, I, I didn't even fire my guns in anger. No time. Saw a couple of fighters at one stage, but everything was in the dark. You know, most nights it was dark, and some nights it was pitch black. And I spent a lot of time looking out of my gun ports. Oh, by the way, I had to look out both gun ports. I had a gun on either side. I only had one beam gunner, so I had to cross from one side to the other and you're just trying to look through the darkness to watch out for other liberators to avoid collisions and in case there are any fighters around. But we were lucky at that stage because they didn't have many fighters to put up against us. And um, the flak was the thing. They used to fire it up into a box and you had to fly through it. And we were lucky. Other, other chaps weren't so lucky. There were six of us in the tent when we started. We ended up in a few months, we only had four. So that was a bit grim, waking up in the morning on a winter's night and you look and the stretch is empty and you find one of your pals and you wait to hear whether they've landed somewhere and you don't hear it. And then the next thing is the admin tells you, please pack up warrant officers. Uh, well, the one was Thomas pack up his private goods and you have to pack up his goods and take it away, his personal belongings and take it up. And then a few, not so long after that, we wake up and Steve wasn't in his t in stretcher, but uh, he was in an unlucky crew. He flew with Captain Ace and they were, they went on a raid, came all the way back and collided with a raft liberator in the, over the uh, area. So that means 16 men going down. But uh, that was the worst thing, I think, was to wake up and to see that uh, somebody was missing there and then you wait to hear what's happening. When we were training on the pilot's course, they put us into this decompression chamber and they took us up and they told us at a certain altitude, you would think you're fine. And they gave us sums to do, simple sums. And we dashed them off, no trouble at all. Then they, when we checked them, we found we made a lot of stupid mistakes. That was to illustrate that. It, so the point is that when you get to 7,000 feet, you put your oxygen on, you see. And then they took us up higher, and then you pass out. And you don't know you've passed out, and then you connect the oxygen again, you come, and they make you write your name and address. And I wrote Wilbur Wannenberg, the, for Buena Vista, Upper Scott Street Gardens, Cape Town, and I kept on writing. I didn't know I'd passed out. That was to show us that if we bailed out at high altitude, but we never flew that high, but if we did bail out at high altitude, we should not pull the ripcord immediately. Because they'd found that pilots were landing dead because they'd pulled the ripcord at very high altitudes and there, weren't, there was no oxygen. So, the, I knew that oxygen, lack of oxygen, wasn't a good thing. And we were flying along one night and uh, 
Suddenly, I didn't realize it, I started talking slowly, and eventually I was actually on the floor of the aircraft, because I was trying to breathe oxygen through a thin tube. And I didn't know the oxygen tank must have been only half filled or something like that. And I was on my, and I thought, well, this, I've got to report to Skipper, so I pressed the button. And I told him, Skipper, I'm not getting oxygen. So he said, OK, Wani, hang on a bit. We're nearly at the target. And when we're finished, Jeff can come back. Jeff was our bomber. But Jeff can come back and have a look, see what's going on. And I really, I thought, what is that skipper of mine? I had a lot of trust in him, but here I'm going dying on the floor of the aircraft. And he wants to go and bomb the Hun, not worried about his air gunner. And then it sunk into me that there's an oxygen tank on the other side of the aircraft, on the beam position. So I crawled over there, plugged in, and I felt an awful fool, and I had to report one ear, yes, Skipper, I'm all right, I'm in on the other side. But I did, I really felt foolish, but it showed my, I was really a green, you know, I was the new to the job. And I, but that was the lack of oxygen that you can't think when yeah, you're, you're yeah. lacking oxygen. So that was a, what I thought was a narrow escape. I think generally each squadron put about 10 into the air, depended on what was available. Now, we didn't have any information on that. All I knew was that when I went to the ops room for briefing, there were usually about 80 men there. So that made about 10 aircraft. But of course, we were two South African squadrons but they were also all RAF squadrons. Now you can't have 80 aircraft, sometimes there were 80 aircraft on the raid from all the squadrons. You can't have 80 aircraft all flying for that one point over the target where they can release the bombs and make sure of hitting them. So each squadron flew at a slightly different height. We normally flew at about 9,000 feet. And that meant that at 9,000 feet you might have 10 aircraft, but there was still the danger of collisions because everything was dark. They were showing no lights. And the other thing that worried me was that I couldn't sense the time was passing. Now, we were flying for four hours, five hours, sometimes six hours. And that worried me slightly. I got nervous afterwards, of course, with the flak and things like that. But what worried me was that I had no sense of time. I couldn't look at my watch. I had too much, there was a lot of clothing on. And I could feel the aircraft rising and I could hear the engines, but you can't see the ground moving below. So there's no sense of time moving. And it worried me, so I said to Skipper, can't you tell me when we're getting near the target? So he agreed and he used to tell me, okay, another half hour to the target, another quarter of an hour to I was quite happy. Coming home, it was a different thing. I didn't worry about the time, but just going there, I wanted to know where we were and I didn't know a thing. But that helped me, knowing that we were another half an hour to the so on. And of course, they gave us boxes of window. Now those were the thin strips of metal. Very thin strips. I don't know how many bundles they put in that cardboard box at my feet. But it was quite funny, really. There was always a bit of a loss at uh, briefing. Because they say, OK, chaps, three bundles per minute. So you're supposed to throw out a bundle every 20 seconds. That makes the minute. But when you're flying over the target and you're approaching the target, skipper would say, OK, you can start unloading the window. For one thing, I'm not going to count seconds. The se other thing was I had nothing to do except look out the aircraft. So throwing bundles of window out gave me something to do. It relieved the tension a bit, I think. And each bundle was about 12 inches long and it was in a square, folded into square, or what can I call it? Uh, not a tube, but a, a square, bo a long box. And it was, you just banged it on the side of the window sill and it would open it and you throw it out and you see this hundreds or thousands, I don't know how many pieces of metal foil were in each bundle, floating out the window and when they caught the light you could see them. 